Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Great Lakes, the Great Plains, the Great Wall of China. The word great is used all the time. And not only when it's applied to sites and places, but especially when it's applied to people and nations. For example, Alexander the Great, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, the greatest generation, Great Britain. And how can we forget, make America great again? This word, great, is a great word because it elevates its object in the mind of the hearer. It sets the lakes or the plains or the wall of China or Alexander, Peter, Catherine, Britain or America heads above all others, greater than all others. Well, our epistle reading this morning from 1 John identifies for us the one who is truly and eternally and universally greater than all others. And it assures us that he who is in you, Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world, Satan. Yes, God's love for the world in Christ is greater than all that oppose him. And my friends, that's an assurance we need to hear in this world of competing belief systems and values in ideologies. The spirits of the age, we might call them, each appealing to us and to our children, wanting to claim us as their own. Now the spirits of the age who are competing for God's children appear on the surface at least to be very great. And it's those spirits that St. John is talking about in our text for today when he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. My friends, don't make the mistake of misunderstanding or minimizing the word spirit here. Thinking it simply refers to some abstract, impersonal, and ultimately unharmful belief system, value, or idea. For John isn't talking here about spirits or ideas that are good or even neutral. But rather, he is warning us about the spirits that come from Satan. And whether it's religion, values, or philosophy of some sort, each so-called spirit of the age is embodied in and controls the minds and hearts and deeds, indeed the very lives of all who are not connected by faith to the vine, Jesus Christ, as we heard in today's Gospel reading. And even for those of us who are connected to Christ, these spirits seek to entice us and draw us away from him. For you see, Satan's goal is to cut us off from Jesus, knowing that as Jesus says, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing and are good for nothing except to be thrown into the fire and burned. Well, Satan's goal for God's people today is the same as it was for the people of John's day too. And for the initial recipients of John's letter around the year 80, the spirit of the age was that of the Greco-Roman culture that enveloped their lives in Ephesus. Ephesus was a major Greek port city in what is today Turkey. You know, one of the things I love about studying history is that you're constantly reminded of the truth of the old adage that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And this insight is true, of course, because there's one thing that hasn't changed over the course of time, the sinful nature of mankind. As I read a little bit about the ancient city of Ephesus, it reminded me a lot of modern-day San Francisco. Although, to be fair, you can find the sins and misdeeds of Ephesus in any American city, large or small, including here in Racine. 
But like San Francisco, Ephesus boasted in its status as a beautiful and diverse city by the sea. Tens of thousands of tourists came to visit Ephesus each year, and it prided itself on its diversity, including diversity of all manners of religion and religious thoughts. And like in that city by the bay, not Green Bay, but San Francisco, unbridled sexuality was expressed and paraded openly in Ephesus. I still recall when I was about 12 years old, it was around 1985, and my parents took my sister and me on a trip to San Francisco. She knew I grew up in Los Angeles, and we took a trip all the way up the West Coast to Seattle and back, and we stopped in San Francisco on the way. Well, little did we know that the annual Gay Pride Parade was being held that day in San Francisco, and it was eye-opening, to say the least, to see all the types of attire and behavior that were on display in the streets, trolley cars, and parks of the city. I still haven't forgotten it, more than 30 years later. Well, likewise, these kinds of activities weren't uncommon in the ancient city of Ephesus either. The spirit of Ephesus, this corrupt and debased culture that enveloped the city, daily challenged the faith of the Christians to whom John was writing, whom he endearingly calls his little children. John was so moved by parental concern for them that he wrote his letter to warn them about these spirits that would lead them astray, to equip them to test the spirits, to see if they were of Christ or of Antichrist, and to keep connected with them as they engaged in this spiritual warfare. Even as would any Christian parent today would do, whose son or daughter leaves home to study or work in some metropolitan city like New York, Los Angeles, or San Francisco. And so St. John writes to them, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. My friends, John's words apply equally to us here today in 21st century America. Beloved, test and see whether the spirits that permeate our culture are really great and worthy to be followed. And test and see whether perhaps you've been too open to follow these spirits instead of following the spirit of Christ your Lord. For example, the spirit of compromise rather than that of confession in the presence of those who would see Jesus Christ as only one of the many faces of God or of even being less than God. This false idea that all people worship the same God, we just call him by different names. Whether it's Buddha or Allah or God, it really doesn't matter. It's all one and the same. Or the spirit of relativism which says, truth is relative. Who can know it? What's true for you may not be true for me. Who are you to judge? This is an old spirit. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? When he who is the way and the truth and the life was standing right there in front of him. Or the spirit of immorality, or worse yet, amorality, which says, Do whatever you want. Anything goes. Do whatever makes you feel good. There's no such thing as right or wrong. Love whomever you want. Or the spirit of a false, so-called tolerance, which is highly intolerant of anyone or anything that disagrees with it. Or the spirit of intimidation, which uses the threat of lawsuits and force to compel you to do that which is politically correct and not biblically correct. Test the spirits, John writes, to see whether they are from God. Well, how do we do this? John says, 
Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Notice that John says the spirits are discernible. So how do we discern them? Again, John writes, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And so the answer to how we rightly discern the spirits, of course, is Jesus. It's still all about Jesus. It was in John's day when he wrote these words. It was for Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation 500 years ago, and it is still true for us here today. John reminds us that the one who is in us, Jesus, is greater than the one who is in the world. Satan. Jesus is greater than the spirits of every age. Whether it's the spirit of compromise, relativism, immorality, false tolerance, or intimidation. He is greater than the spirit that wants us to minimize or deny our sinfulness for Jesus died for it. He is greater than the spirit of antichrist that is at work in the world. He is greater than our sin of giving way to these false spirits in thought, word, and deed. He is greater than our heart when it condemns us for our sin. And he is greater than all that would seek to overcome us. The devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh because he died and rose again for us. Jesus who is greater than all the evil spirits of this world, including Satan himself, abides in us. He abides in you by his word and Holy Spirit. John writes, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. My friends, despite all these false spirits in our world, you confess Jesus to be the Son of God, to be your Lord and Savior, because Jesus abides in you. He put his Spirit in you in your baptism just as he did for the Ethiopian eunuch in today's first reading from Acts. And by his Spirit, Jesus comes to you every Sunday through his Word and Holy Supper, by which he sustains you in this world with his crucified body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, Jesus Christ is in you. He has made your body to be a temple of his Holy Spirit so that you may love one another, confess him to one another and to the world, and cast out all fear of the world and he who is in it, knowing that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen.